Greetings once again, brothers and sisters, and welcome again to Hardcore Truth, where we are bringing the light of uh, truth into the darkness of apostasy and compromise. Our goal here at uh, Pathfinders is to find and feed the hungry and finally give drink to the thirsty. Uh, I believe, we believe that there is yet a remnant in these last days who love truth. And I hope that you're a part of that remnant. Hardcore Outreach is a ministry of Pathfinders Ministries that is led by me, Bob Lubeck. And uh, if you're helped again by these messages, please click on subscribe and then click on notifications. And please tell other people about us. Tell other people people. Let's get the uh, word out to those who indeed are hungry and thirsty. Uh, if you would like to contact us, our email is pathfindersmin, P-A-T-H-F-I-N-D-E-R-S-M-I-N at gmail.com. I got a message today from someone in Japan who's been <laughs> looking at these, and that was kind of a blessing. So we're now again in a series of messages called The Theology of Worship and Service, and it's from the book of Leviticus, and we are going to be looking now at uh, chapter 16 of the book of Leviticus, and it's going to be about the great day of atonement. So let's pray as we dive in to the Word of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to do this. I thank you for the man who paid for this equipment to be able to do this. I thank you, Lord, for your leading to do it. I thank you, Lord, for those who are listening. And I thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy in these last days. And I pray, Lord God, for your Holy Spirit to be upon me and upon those who are listening. And I pray, Lord God, that you would move us to a deeper place with you, a deeper understanding as we look at the great day of atonement, Lord, that you would move us to understand what a tremendous thing you have done for mankind. And I pray this, Lord God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so, what a journey we've been on as we're diving into this wonderful book of Leviticus. Leviticus, uh, meaning written to the priests, for the priests, and uh, we have learned that we are the last day's priests and that this book then is as much written to us as it was to them in that day. In fact, that was the shadow. This is the real. And so uh, last time in chapters 12 through 15, we saw the importance of separation. Uh, if we're going to be the true worshipers that God has called us to be, we've got to separate from the things of the world, the flesh and the devil, the people of the world and the flesh and the devil, and be separated unto God. God's true desire is that we come to him and have an offering of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we worship him in spirit and in truth as his light-bearing, anointed soldier priests. This is the call on our life. This is what we were created for, to worship God. Uh, we are created to be worshipers, and so uh, I guess we got to choose who we're going to worship. Uh, but there are things in the way if we want to be worshipers of God. There, there are some things in the way. There's sin. It's sin is in the way, and and then there is the guilt and the condemnation that follows our sin. A long time ago, I learned a lesson about the difference between true guilt and false guilt. A lot of people are in bondage to false guilt. What is false guilt? It's trying to live up to our own expectations or the expectations of others. We can never do that. True guilt, well, and when we don't do it, well, how do you deal with it? <laughs> you just keep trying to live up to their expectations. True guilt is not living up to God's expectations, and we've got a lot that we can do about that. We can confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. You see, true guilt isn't living up to God's expectations, and there's a way to deal with it, and that's what we're going to get into today, the great day of atonement. And we're also going to see that within the great day of atonement, there's a way to deal with that guilt and that condemnation. Those problems keep us from entering into the presence of God. And so far, 
in this book of Leviticus, God has not dealt finally and completely with sin, guilt, and condemnation. Therefore, we now move into the great day of at one ment. That's the way it's spelled, at one ment. The Yom Kippur. Uh, the Kippur, the word means to cover. And so it was on this day that covering was made for the sins of the people for over the preceding year. Uh, and once again, God makes his people at one with him through his mercy. Wow, what a great God. Yet, even this great feast did not finally and completely deal with sin and guilt and condemnation. But it was the best that the law had to offer. Let us remember that the law is our schoolmaster, and it's there to bring us from the shadow into the real. And so Yom Kippur is a picture of Christ suffering and offering his blood on the cross for our sin, making us, the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, at one with him and at peace with him. Yom Kippur is also a picture of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, where the source of our guilt and condemnation will finally be dealt with. All of the feast days of the Lord, as we're going to see later as we move along into the feast days in, uh, in the uh, book of Leviticus, all of God's feast days were meant to be times of great celebration, joy, singing and tambourines, and uh, the, the Jews really know how to, how to celebrate. But yeah, God, these are God's feasts, and he wanted his people to celebrate them, except on the Day of Atonement. This feast was the only feast where God demanded, commanded, demanded that they afflict their souls with fasting. In fact, this day is the only day that fasting was mandated by the law, and those who did not fast were cut off. The people were also forbidden to do any work on this day, and if they did any work on the Day of Atonement, they were put to death. Serious business, this feast. It's the only day that the high priest was allowed to go, to go in, to enter into the Holy of Holies. Huh. What we're talking about here in this feast is the crucifixion of the Son of God. The high priest, it was so sacred that he had to leave his, his home and live inside the temple area for one week so that he did not become defiled in any way. The feast was done on the seventh month, of the, on the tenth day of that month, and that would put it in, a, in our calendar, would put it in the months of September and or October. In this year that I'm doing this, this particular year, it would be September 15th and 16th that the Day of Atonement will be celebrated. So let's dive into the scriptures and study the great Day of Atonement. Uh, we begin with the preparation of the priest. Leviticus 16, 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, after the death of his sons, uh, 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 excuse me, after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died, that would be, the, we, we studied that already. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place, wherein the veil, the mercy seat, which is upon the ark of, of the covenant, that he die not, for I will appear in a cloud upon the mercy seat. So Nadab and Abihu, they went in. Uh, kind of was like they could just come and go. They went in, they offered strange fire, and, and, they, and they died because of it. And, and so now God is saying, nobody can come in here ever except the high priest and then, and then only on this specific day he can come, and he has to come the way I say he can come. Any other way is sinful and will bring death. 
this is this this whole thing has great meaning for men in these last days. You see, there are many voices today teaching that there are many ways to enter into the presence of God. Even amongst Christians, of course, there's all the cults and there's all the uh, all the different religions, the Buddhists, the, and on and on and on the list of of other religions goes. Uh, but even within Christianity, we have to do things the way God said to do them. We can't just come any way we want to. Come as you are, stay as you are, seems to be a uh, a way of thinking a way, uh, among many Christian groups today. 1 Timothy 2, 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. We must come the way God said to come. There's only one God. There's only one way to come to that God, and that's through the real Christ, not some Christ that we make up. Any other way is a sin, and ultimately will bring death. There was an extreme reverence demonstrated by the people on this day of entering in to the Holy of Holies. But today, uh, many people call Jesus Lord and are called by his name, Christians. And yet, they live any way they want to live. And uh, they, they come, but they don't hear his voice. And if they come and hear his voice, they don't do what he says. Instead, they get caught up in all kinds of religious stuff that really isn't what he wants from us. I guess it goes... From, uh, denominationally, from, from incense to nonsense. Uh, uh, this is why uh, our great King David, the man who had the heart that was after God, told us what the most important thing in life was to him. In Psalm 27, 4 and 5, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me and he shall set me up upon a rock. Jesus, of course, is the rock. The tabernacle back then was the tabernacle. We're going to Talk about that here in a little bit. The secret place, as we'll see as we move on, is the holiest of all, the holy of holies. And the beauty of the Lord? What is the beauty of the Lord? It's his holiness, brothers and sisters. And you and I can enter into the house of the Lord because the curtain is rent. The curtain has been rent from top to bottom. And now we can go in not only to the tabernacle, but because the, we become the tabernacle, we can go into the Holy of Holies and commune with God. Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Boy, do I want to abide uh, under the shadow of the Almighty. In order to do that, I've got to be going into that secret place. If we'll enter into the secret place, we'll have victory and our foundation will be built upon Christ the rock. The secret place, what is the secret place for us today in the New Testament? It's that closet that Jesus told us about, that we enter into our closet and we pray in secret. And God who sees in secret shall reward us openly. <laughs> he said, those are the words of Jesus. In fact, everything about real Christianity flows from the secret place of the prayer closet and abiding in him. There's only one way into the holy of holies. There's only one way into the secret place of prayer and abiding in him, and that is through our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. The good news is that through faith, we have justification, just as if I'd never done it, and we can go in. But who goes in? 
who goes into the secret place of the closet of prayer, uh, uh, who, who enters into the holy of holies, who gets alone and shuts out the world and listens to the voice of God in his holy word. Hardly anyone. There, I know there's a few, there's a remnant. I hope I'm talking to, the, to them. It's been replaced with the foolishness of busyness, the foolishness of religious activity, chasing the world, and sleep, <laughs> of all things. I suppose sleep is one of the biggest things that keeps people from the holy of holies, from the secret place of prayer. I use the word justification. What a, what a great word. To render, it means to render just, to render innocent or acquit, to declare to be righteous. You know, you go to court for something that you didn't do, and the jury comes back, and they don't ever say innocent. <laughs> they say not guilty. Not The verdict is not guilty. They, it's never a verdict of innocent. We are innocent till proven guilty, but the verdict is not guilty. Whereas with God, it goes a little deeper than just not guilty, even though justification is declaring us not guilty, but it's declaring us innocent <laughs> and to be made righteous. Romans 5, 1 and 2, therefore being justified. Again, the word means to render just or innocent, to acquit to acquit, to declare to be righteous. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith in this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Through justification, we have access to God. We have access into the secret place of the Most High. Another word that's used is propitiation, and it means to cover. The lid of the ark is the place of propitiation, and it's for an atoning victim, the mercy seat, and all that was in the Holy of Holies. So, let's pause for a minute here and ask, why was this 15 foot by 15 foot by 15 foot cube called the holiest of all, the holy of holies. That's what was on the other side of the curtain, a 15 foot cube <laughs> lined with gold. The one on earth was only a pattern of the one that was in heaven. But why is it in heaven? And why is it on earth? And why is it so holy? Let's look at it for a minute. So much gold. And the beauty that went into this place. And the detail that went into this place. All of the walls of this 15-foot cube were covered with gold. There were two huge angels made out of olive wood that were on the back wall, uh, just behind the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. These two angels were 10 feet tall and had outstretched wings that touched each other. The Ark had two angels, one at one end and the other at the other, one at the head and one at the foot, and were overlaid with gold as well. <laughs> And they had wings that reached out and touched one another over the top of the ark, the mercy seat. Again, the ark, the mercy seat, were overlaid with gold in and out. <laughs> Why all this beauty? The thing was only like about four feet by, by 18 inches. 200 pounds, some people think it weighed, of gold. I bet you'd like to have 200 pounds of gold today. <laughs> why? Why is it all this gold? Why, why is it called the Holy of Holies? Why is it called the Ark of the Covenant? Well, I was questioning that. 
in prayer for several days, I was wondering, Lord, there's more to this than what I understand it to be. And then I was directed in my mind to go to John chapter 20, verses 11 and 12. This little obscure verse gave me the answer and will give you the answer if you don't already know it. John 20, 11 and 12, after the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, Mary comes to the sepulchre and it says, But Mary stood without at the sepulchre weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre and seeth two angels in white sitting, one at the head, the other at the foot, where the body of Jesus had laid. Uh -huh. Do you see it? <laughs> The Holy of Holies is the type of that tomb, that sepulcher, in which Christ was going to be entombed. And the mercy seat is the place where the dead body of the Son of God was laid. And the two angels were there to protect and honor and defend the dead body of the Son of God. And if that's not enough, the mercy seat is also the place where the great miracle of the resurrection of the dead body of the Son of God was raised from the dead. This is why our forgiveness was bought with a price that while insignificant to some people, it is holy and it is sacred to the Father. Inside of that ark, which is a type of the heart of man, was the Ten Commandments that were broken, the manna that was spurned and despised, and the rod of authority that was misused. Oh, praise God! Uh, uh, the sin of man's heart has been covered by the blood of Christ. Oh, there's such a lack of reverence and a holy fear of the Lord today. The crucified and risen Christ is our covering for sin. Only in Christ can sin be covered and the sinner declared righteous and free. John eleven twenty five. 25, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Wow. It is in this great day, this great feast of atonement, that we learn of justification and propitiation which get rid of sin and condemnation and guilt. If only we would see what we have in Christ and get rid of the apathy we have and have a reverence for, for, and holy, godly fear to enter in to the Holy of Holies. As I pointed out in the past, that ugly word, apathy, I believe with all of my heart, that there is a devil over America, a, a principality, and his name is apathy, and he's caused the American people to be apathetic about everything. We are the richest, most prosperous, most blessed nation that the world has ever known, freest on top of all of that, and we're apathetic about it to the point where we're giving it away for safety. Apathy about the Word of God. Apathy about our salvation. Apathy about what Christ has accomplished on the cross. And that indeed it was Christ, the Son of God, who accomplished that on the cross. So let's go on and learn more. And get the right kind of heart to be free to worship God. Uh, chapter 16, verses 3 and 4. Uh, thus shalt Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and he uh, shall uh, have linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are the holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. We must note that only Aaron was to come into that holy place. The work was his and his alone. 
The work of the atonement was the work of our great high priest, Christ Jesus, and it was his work alone, and only he could accomplish it. Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast taken no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. He didn't have to do it, but he did it. God the Father prepared a body for his son, and in that body and his son was crucified. We also see that our uh, great high priest laid aside his garments of honor and beauty, and he took on him the garments of the normal priests, the linen garments. And we see that in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. As I've told you, the book of Leviticus is the most referred to uh, book in the New Testament. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 is getting directly at the high priest setting aside his 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 high priestly garments and putting on those linen garments. And he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of men, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Dating right back to the book of Leviticus. We must also point out, as we look at the preparation of the high priest, that Aaron, the high priest, had to wash his flesh. When when the humble Jesus began his ministry, the first thing he did was to wash his flesh in the river of baptism, of John's baptism. And the first thing that we're supposed to do as new believers is to be immersed and washed in water, which is symbolic in what is taken place already in the inner man. But you know what? I have found over the years that there are many, many people who claim to be Christians who've never been baptized. Somehow apathetical about it. If you're one of those, you better seek it out right now. Let's go on with the preparation of the priest in verses 5 and 6. And he shall... Take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for sin offering and one ram for burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. It was necessary for Aaron <coughs> to do a sin offering for himself and his family and his tribe, uh, but because he was a sinful man himself. But Christ was without sin. <laughs> And he didn't need to offer for himself because he is the great and true high priest. Hebrews 4.15 For you have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let's go on and look at the preparation of the place. This is really important here right now. 7 through 14 of Leviticus 16, and he shall take two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots, would be with the Urim and the Thummim, upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord, the other lot for Azazel, which is translated in most as the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which fell to the Lord's lot and offer him for a sin offering before the Lord to make an atonement for him. And, and, uh, and the other goat, which is alive, you shall present before the Lord and let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of the burning coals of fire from off of the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of the sweet incense beaten small, and bring it to within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that a cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not 
and he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. Note the two goats. We're going to look at this in a little while, but for now, before Aaron could do anything, he had to first prepare the place. Aaron had to enter the Holy of Holies with the blood of the bullock for himself and for the house, and he had to have his hands full of burning coals of incense that he, 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 he sh kind of sneak in uh, under, the, under the veil and let the room be filled with that smoke that it cover him, that he not die with the censer full of the sweet-smelling savor. He, he could now enter the Holy of Holies, and that, that smoke filled that room. This is awesome. A type of the blood of Christ has now entered the Holy of Holies. Think of the fear that Aaron must have had. Would he come out alive? <laughs> he didn't know. In fact, tradition tells us that they tied a, a, a rope. We know that he had bells around the bottom of his garments, so if he stopped moving, they would know. Uh, but they tied a rope around his legs, so if he dropped dead, they could drag him out of there without going in themselves and dropping dead. But the smoke of the incense, which is the prayers of the saints, represents Christ in us, covered him as he entered. Ephesians 5, 2, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Christ in us. Let's go on. The preparation of the place, 15 through 19. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do uh, with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression and all their sins and so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make atonement to the holy place until he come out and have made atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about and he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with the finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it for the uncleanness of the children of Israel. He went in for himself. He comes back out. And now he's going back in for the people. The brazen altar, the outer court, uh, there the bullock and, the, and one of the goats is slain. And Christ was made sin and taken outside the city and slain for the sins of man. Hebrews 13, 12, Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. The book of Hebrews is basically the book of Leviticus in the New Testament, by the way. Now Aaron, the high priest, goes into the Holy of Holies uh, with the blood offering of atonement, at one mint. This offering is to cover the holy place because of the condemnation of the sins of man. Even the brazen altar that the blood was had to have the blood applied sin has polluted the plan of God. But now, the blood makes the polluted clean. I actually believe, can't prove it. It's just an opinion. Uh, when I give an opinion, I will tell you it's an opinion. <laughs> and I don't do that very often. <laughs> but I believe on the day of of the offering, the blood of Christ when Christ was crucified, that he actually offered that blood in heaven at the real Holy of Holies, at the real Ark of the Covenant. Hebrews 9.23, it was therefore necessary that the pattern of these things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, Christ himself. That's what I base what I believe on. 
now the throne of God. This isn't an opinion anymore. (laughs) Now the throne of God has been satisfied with the blood of Christ. And we can now, through faith in that blood, have access to God. Romans 5, 8 through 11. But God, boy, I like that when the Bible says that because a lot of times there there comes all this trouble that's upon men, but then, but God. (laughs) But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, yet sinners, not righteous, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. There it is. Leviticus and Romans. (laughs) The holy place is now prepared to accept anyone who puts their faith in the blood of the Lamb. Now the curtain is torn and we can go in. Please see this, last day's priest. We we have to be the worshipers that God has called us to be by separation. He must be above all in our lives. Because of his death we have in resurrection, we have his grace in our lives. Sin has been dealt with through the shed blood of Christ. But there's still something hindering. And that is this feeling of guilt and condemnation for the past. Most Christians believe in the atonement for the forgiveness of their sins. But many struggle with the shame of guilt and condemnation over the ugliness of the flesh of the past. As I have pointed out before, we should be ashamed that we should not live in shame. In other words, we shouldn't be going around bragging about our sin. We should be ashamed of what we've done, but not living in shame because we are cleansed of it. And the guilt and the condemnation is over of the ugliness of our flesh and the past. So let's go on and deal with this hindrance of guilt and condemnation to our worship of God as he prepares his people. Leviticus 16, 20, 22. And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation and the offer, offering, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both of his hands upon the head of the live goat. And confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all the iniquities unto the of the land, not in, into a land not inhabited, and he shall let it go, uh, uh, let the goat go in the wilderness. Traditionally, what they what we're told that they would actually do is take that goat out into a, into a wilderness place and and back him off a cliff so that he would fall down off that cliff and and be killed. And some people believe that that's actually the place where Judas uh, hung himself and then fell down and let his bowels burst out. But we don't know that for sure. But we do know this for sure. <laughs> Aaron has now sprinkled the blood of the dead goat on the mercy seat of atonement. And now he takes his hands, probably covered in blood, and puts them on the head of the live goat. Why? Because it says Aaron is imparting the condemnation and the guilt of the sinful flesh and the sins of mankind on the head of this goat. And the guilt of the blood of Christ right on the head of that goat. Not only are we forgiven, but we're free of the condemnation and guilt over our Adamic nature and all of our sins through the second goat. Psalm 103, 12. 
as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Why do we struggle with the past? The past has gone into the wilderness, never to be spoken of again, unless we speak of it in bragging about our past lives. It's over. It's finished. John 19.30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it's finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. We can come into the Holy of Holies and worship God free of sin, free of guilt, free of condemnation of the devil. And it's in the second goat that we find our guilt and condemnation going to where it belongs. How is the second goat connected? The Greek word that's translated scapegoat is A-Z-A-Z-E. And, it, and it's translated Azazel. Azazel. The word got translated scapegoat and is taught to be a type of Christ. But that's not true. There's no picture of Christ being sent into the wilderness with the sin of the world on him, never to return? My goodness, if that second goat is a type of Christ, he ain't coming back. But it's not a type of Christ. It's clearly a, a picture of the blood offering of the first goat, which uh, uh, there's no doubt that that's Christ. And that relates to his first coming. However, it, it's a real stretch to try to connect him to the second goat. And I believe this goat is a type of the devil and his antichrist and his fallen angels. And in that, we are free of the guilt of sin because it was put back on his head. And he was sent out into the wilderness never to return. Well, why do I believe this? Because it makes sense, <laughs> first of all. And second of all, that word Azazel doesn't translate scapegoat. Please listen to the words of Holman's Bible Dictionary. Quote, the second goat was said to be for Azazel. The word Azazel is interpreted to mean a rocky place in the desert or a demon of the desert. In the book of Enoch, which is not a book in the Bible, it's a historical book written by Enoch, he's identified as a leader of the fallen angels who lies bound beneath rocks in the desert awaiting judgment. That's in the book of Enoch. Now, we can't form doctrine from the book of Enoch because it's not in the Bible. But the book of Enoch is quoted in the Bible, giving it very strong weight. You might ask where that is. It's in Jude 1, 14, 15. If we follow this strong as evidence concerning Azazel, we can see how the Day of Atonement is also directly connected to the second coming of Christ in the last days. First goat, first coming, the blood offering. Second goat, second coming. And what does it mean? <laughs> For it's here that God will put the guilt of all sin back on the head of the devil and his fallen angels, and he will put the guilt for the, for the necessity of Christ being crucified on the cross on the head of the devil and his fallen angels, and he will send them and put them into the lake of fire, not to return. Revelation 20, 2 and 3, And he laid hold of that dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. And after that he's loosed for a little season. But then, saints, after that, <laughs> when the thousand years are expired, Satan, Satan shall be loosed of his prison, and shall go out and deceive the nations which are on the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. The number 
number of whom it is as the sand of the sea. And they went out of the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down of God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet and uh, are and shall be tormented day and night forever, never to return. <laughs> the second goat. <laughs> the second goat. Now let's wrap up this chapter and close out this teaching with verses 23 and 24 of chapter 16. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there and shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth uh, and offer burnt offerings and the burnt offerings of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. Aaron had to wash after all, the, all of this blood and, and had to leave the garments of, of his humility behind and put on his priestly garments. Jesus after giving himself as an offering, you remember he had, they washed his body before they laid it on the, on the, on the, in the tomb. He was washed and then he was risen in his former glory and he put on his, his son of God clothes again. <laughs> and Moses, as he closes, shares an important, the importance of this feast and, and how, we must, how they had to fast and keep it. However, before that, he tells them, all those involved with the goat to wash their clothes on themselves. This means that those who are partakers of this offering of the Lord Jesus Christ must wash our behavior and our hearts. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that hath promised and let us consider one another and provoke one another unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. We're not to take this lightly. We're not to be apathetical about it. Those who partake in the atonement must also give atonement to others. Those who partake in the forgiveness of God must give forgiveness to others. Ephesians 4, 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you. And all with all malice, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is how we last day's priest must show reverence for the word. This is how we as last day's priests can and must show worship to our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for the day of atonement in the Old Testament that helps us understand the depth of it in the New Testament from the shadow to the real, from the law, letter of the law to the spirit of the law. Lord God, help us to get rid of apathy. Help us to get rid of bitterness. Lord, help us to believe in the first goat and in the second goat and the meaning behind them. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God bless you. Until next time, may God richly bless you.